Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, because we're just going to jump into it. I got an email a few weeks back that was like, I love this show, but I'd really like to have an episode where you're kind of like just going through the internet with us and talking about and commenting on the news. And to me, that sounded like, I hate this show and you're worthless, Philip DeFranco. Because of course, I'm allergic to pretty much anything that can even remotely sound like criticism and other people's ideas, blah. But that sounds like a great way to have a lazy day, so let's do it. Let's see, we have court rules. Trump must testify under oath in New York State's investigation. Ruling that Trump and his children, Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump Jr. are obligated to testify under oath in New York State's investigation into the Trump Organization's financial dealings, State Attorney General Letitia James announced on Thursday. Very cool, excited to see that result once again and nothing. It's like watching people for years and years try to grip water. Though in other Trump news, you had Trump endorsements collapse in Georgia. This, because you know, David Perdue, weeks after repeating the big line, days after telling Stacey Abrams to go back where she came from and saying that she had demeaned her race loss in spectacular fashion to Brian Kemp, who at least didn't engage and believe Donald Trump's big lie and like I guess the new bar for Republican decency is not trying to completely undo democracy. But I would also argue that the results in Georgia tell a mixed story because yes, Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger survived and did so with great numbers in their primary. At the same time in Georgia, you have Trump backed Herschel Walker very much seeming like he could become the next senator from Georgia. And holy fuck, like if you ever feel like you're having a day where you're like, oh man, am I stupid? Watch this clip of Herschel Walker trying to like explain a solution to the gun problem or specifically the mass shooting of children in our country. See, there is a person willing that weapon, you know, Cain, Kia, Abel, you know, and uh, you know, and that's the problem that we have. And I said, what we need to do is look into how we can stop those things. You know, he talked about doing a disinformation. What about getting a department that can look at young men that's looking at uh, women that looking at uh, just social media? What about doing that, looking into things like that, and we can stop that that way? But yet they want to just continue to talk about taking away your constitutional rights. Like you don't even just see it and hear it. Like you'd somehow smell the CTE from that clip. And in Georgia, it's going to be Herschel Walker versus Raphael Warnock, which essentially is like Warnock versus a baked potato. But the baked potato is the odds on favorite. Then Quinta Brunson reacts to wild requests for a school shooting episode of Abbott Elementary. With Brunson tweeting, wild how many people have asked for a school shooting episode of the show I write. People are that deeply removed from demanding more from the politicians they've elected and are instead demanding entertainment. I can't ask, are y'all okay anymore? Because the answer is no. And then follow-up tweets urging her audience to instead use that energy to ask her elected official to get on Beto time and nothing less. And adding, I don't want to sound mean, but I want people to understand the flaw in asking for something like this. We're not okay. This country is rotting our brains. I'm sad about it. So if you're unfamiliar, Brunson created, stars, writes, probably does the catering on Abbott Elementary. It's a fantastic show. If you haven't watched yet, definitely recommend it. With this story and situation, I can kind of see it from both sides. If you're Brunson, you're like, I'm making a sit Come. We're all aware about the mass shooting problem in this country. I can't really like shed a light on it. But on the other side, I understand, you know, just how exasperated and exhausted people are of just like, is there any way we can just make this the last one? Or maybe because the show is widely watched and it takes on this topic, all of a sudden that starts more dinner time conversations, public sentiment changes. But also, if you look at the polls, a lot of like public sentiment is being ignored by politicians. But ultimately, I'm in Brunson's corner here. It's it's not her responsibility if she decides on her own to make an episode about this. Sure. But at this point, like I. I don't know what you could even put on TV or on the internet that makes people see this situation differently, except maybe if they, they went the Emmett Till route. They literally put a photo of his brutalized corpse in the newspaper as a way to say this, this is what is happening. This is what it looks like. And this is what will continue to happen if we don't change. Like I've seen a number of people saying, we need to start showing the victims the horrifying truth behind what's happening here, that it's not just numbers, it's it's not just, you know, kids smiling faces, just the brutality of the situation that we're ignoring. And understand, I'm not saying that's the answer, but I think it kind of highlights just how exhausted and desperate people are. With so many just openly wondering, is there anything that's gonna kind of like shake sense into people? Then we have Kim Kardashian adds chief taste consultant for Beyond Meat to her resume. That just reminds me of the Kanye West Lady Gaga quote. She's the creative director of Polaroid. I like some of the Gaga songs. What the f does she know about cameras? Though, I will say in Kim Kardashian's defense, this is not the first time this year that we saw some Kim Kardashian news and we were like, I'm surprised she would put that in her mouth. Actually, I kind of understand, maybe. A lot of people seem to like it. Then, brace yourself, How to Murder Your Husband, essay writer convicted of murdering her husband. Meanwhile, the writer of How to Get Away with Murder, Scott Free, suspicious. You got romance novelist, now convicted murderer, Nancy Crampton Brophy. She pens an essay titled How to Murder Your Husband and she begins by writing, 
As a romantic suspense writer, I spent a lot of time thinking about murder and consequently about police procedure. After all, if the murder is supposed to set me free, I certainly don't want to spend any time in jail. With her then going on to list the reasons one might want to hypothetically murder their husband. Things like financial gain, passion over the quote, lying, cheating, bastard, falling in love with someone else, being abused by him, or you're just a hitman or a hit woman. Then weighing the pros and cons of different murder weapons with a passage under gun reading, loud, messy, requires some skill, and ultimately concluding with some personal remarks, I find it easier to wish people dead than to actually kill them. I don't want to worry about blood and brains splattered on my walls, and really I'm not good at remembering lies. But the thing I know about murder is that every one of us have it in him slash her when pushed far enough. Then, in a completely separate and no way connected thing, Nancy's husband Daniel was found shot dead inside the Oregon Culinary Institute where he worked in 2018. And later that year, prosecutors accusing her of murdering him, claiming that she stood to gain a lot from his life insurance. Also bringing in witnesses who said that the couple had been struggling with money. Plus, video shows a van believed to be hers around the place he was murdered. Plus, the state claimed she lied about her whereabouts that day. Prosecutors also saying she purchased a ghost gun kit, a Glock 17, and a slide and barrel to fit it. Plus, Nancy's former cellmate testified that she admitted to shooting Daniel twice in the heart. With Nancy ultimately going to trial, though, the jury was not allowed to consider her How to Murder Your Husband essay when making their decision, with that jury ultimately finding her guilty. So especially bad news for Nancy, not only because she's going to be in jail for, I mean, we don't really know yet, she's scheduled to be sentenced next month, but also because in her essay back in 2011, she wrote, let me say clearly for the record, don't like jumpsuits and orange isn't my color. Sad times, Nancy. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Pinfinity, the first and only augmented reality pin company. Pinfinity creates high quality hard enamel collectible pins that come alive in the augmented reality space, bringing our favorite fandoms to life with animation, sound, and interactive experiences. Check out these sick pins for one of my favorite games growing up, Street Fighter. You can collect all your favorite fighters and watch them come to life through their special attack moves. My favorite's Blanca. But that's not all. Pinfinity has officially licensed products from classic film and TV like Transformers, G.I. Joe, Power Rangers, and Jay and Silent Bob. They've even partnered with NASA to celebrate the STS Space Shuttle program. And Pinfinity's patented platform is revolutionizing the way fans display and interact with their favorite IP. For you Magic the Gathering fans and gamers more broadly, they've got two unique subscription lines to help you start and complete your collections. Right now, gaming subscribers will get three exclusive mystery pins from Elder Scrolls Online in partnership with Bethesda. And UMTG fans will not be disappointed in these beautifully crafted, exclusively designed pins. Definitely do not wait, because once these collectibles are sold out, that's it. So head to pins.ar slash DeFranco, check out some of my favorite pins, and start your collection today. That's pins.ar slash DeFranco. You know, in today's show, we've talked about different aspects of the shooting, a lot of it dealing with reactions, but one of the most talked about and emerging narratives right now about the Robb Elementary shooting in Uvalde concerns the timeline of the attack and law enforcement's response. Right, as more and more information about the tragedy has come out, law enforcement authorities have been met with more and more questions and criticism over how long it took them to storm the elementary school. Because according to official accounts, the first report of the gunman approaching the school was made at around 11.30 a.m., but he wasn't shot and killed by a tactical unit until around 1 p.m. During a press conference this afternoon, Victor Escalon Jr., the Department of Public Safety South Texas Regional Director, said that the gunman entered the building at around 11.40 a.m. after shooting at nearby witnesses, climbing a fence into the school parking lot, and shooting at the school. Also notably saying the suspect was unobstructed as he entered the school, disputing his department's previous claim that the attacker had been confronted by a school police officer. And in fact, when asked by reporters if there was a school officer on campus and if the officer was armed, he confirmed that there was not. Escalon then went on to say the police from multiple local units arrived four minutes later and moved back and took cover after the suspect fired at them, hitting some, and saying the gunman went into the classroom where he shot and killed all his victims, but police did not initially make entry because of the gunfire they had received, saying the officers called for backup and additional resources while evacuating children and teachers from other parts of the school. Within an hour later, Border Patrol and tactical teams arriving, entering, and fatally shooting the gunman. And while Escalon said that in the hour, authorities were taking gunfire, negotiations, and developing a team to make entry, he was unable to answer the most pressing questions. Why it took an hour for law enforcement to breach the classroom and shoot the gunman, and whether they could have gone in sooner. And that's really significant because this presser comes after the news that the initial accounts from top enforcement officials and politicians praising the responding officers for acting so quickly have now been disputed by multiple witnesses on the scene. Javier Cazares, a parent who was outside during the attack and whose nine-year-old daughter was killed, explicitly told reporters that the authorities have been misrepresenting the response from law enforcement, saying they said they rushed in and all that. We didn't see that. With him also saying he offered to help the officers, saying he would run in himself, but they told him to let them do their jobs. And adding there were plenty of men out there armed to the teeth that could have gone in faster. This could have been over in a couple minutes. More kids would have been saved, in my opinion. And the thing is, similar accounts have been backed up by numerous other witnesses who told reporters that the parents outside were angrily arguing with police for not storming the school, with one gut-wrenching viral video in particular showing onlookers screaming at the police who were trying to prevent them from crossing a line of tape. And in another video, people can be heard complaining about the police response. These cops are right here. Bro, there's a shooting at the school and these cops are telling everybody to leave, do well. Everybody's here trying to pick up their kids. Look, they're just off parking outside, man. They need to go in there. Look at that 
Bro, they're all in there. The cops ain't doing sh but standing outside. And all the parents are gonna go in. They, they. Yeah, like our kids are there, man. My son right there. Hey, take him the out. 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 I'm like, in that video, tons of witnesses have said that they also saw parents screaming at law enforcement to just let them in if they wouldn't go in themselves. With one witness, Victor Luna, who had a son and two grandchildren at the school, telling reporters the law enforcement response seemed disorganized and claiming that even once police appeared to be inside the school, they weren't where the gunman had been contained, saying, we saw a lot of cops running everywhere. It was also echoed by Javier Cazares, the father who lost his nine-year-old daughter and who told reporters that it took 15 or 20 minutes for law enforcement officers to even bring protective shields to go into the school, saying they were there without proper equipment. And even some law enforcement officials appeared to back that up with the Associated Press reporting. A law enforcement official familiar with the investigation said the Border Patrol agents had trouble breaching the classroom door and had to get a staff member to open the room with a key. Which is why today, if you go on social media, you have a number of people going, that's fucking horrifying. This idea that when the people finally did do their jobs, they were so bad at it that they had to involve an endanger a civilian. And to that point, experts have said that the way law enforcement responded, or more accurately, did not respond, is totally against the protocol that's been in place for years. With Kenneth Trump, a national school security expert with a focus on K-12 schools, saying that the standard protocol for responding to a school shooting is for the first armed officers at the scene to go straight to the attacker and capture them, and that nothing should deter police from doing so. And adding, you bypass the injured, the dead, step over and around them, and continue on because every second counts. Get to the shooter. With him going on to say that even if the police didn't have proper training, the decision not to go inside of the school immediately will be hard to explain because that's been the standard now for literally more than two decades. With many saying not only do law enforcement authorities have a lot of explaining to do, but many saying that as we learn more about the situation, the more it does to kind of take away the idea of a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun. Especially now that we've seen a lot of conservative lawmakers really digging into this idea that the shooting could have been prevented if the school just had one single door into and out of the building. But others seeing flaws in that argument, people like Hassan Piker saying, the reason why they're moving fast from the good guys with guns would have solved this situation to good guys with gun at one door is because the cops there demonstrably failed to stop him, so now they gotta add layers. Or with people wondering, how can you keep arguing that we just need more people with guns when the people that have the guns and the responsibility to protect these kids didn't move? With people pointing out in the video, some of those officers seem more worried about the parents. One even had like a Taser out. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this has kind of just resulted in really ugly, dumb arguments happening online. There's one in particular that blew up on Reddit. It's someone who was responding to criticism of the officers with, is this sarcasm? It seems like sarcasm, because if you want them to charge into an active shooter situation, you should probably try to pretend to have a little more respect for them. To which someone responded, you're right, cops should only feel obligated to save the lives of children if everyone on the internet is super nice to them. My apologies. And here's the thing, I don't know what it is to be in that situation. Most people won't, and I don't know what it is to be a police officer day in, day out. But I do understand Understand from the position of a parent, if I was there, I wasn't able to would do what pretty much any parent would do, put their life on the line for their child. In seconds and minutes and then over an hour pass and it looks like these people aren't doing a damn thing for you. It would be hard for me not to see every officer that wasn't doing anything to stop this shooter as a Scott Peterson who of course famously hit outside of the Parkland shooting. But that's the story, that's what a lot of people are feeling right now and of course I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts with these new revelations? But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thank you for watching. I love yo faces, and I'll see you next time. If you want a solution, stop selling AR-15s in the state of Texas. You want a solution? Have universal background checks. We don't have them. You want a solution? Red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders, which stop a shooting before it happens. You want a solution? Safe storage laws. Those are four solutions that have been brought up by the people of Texas. Each one of those has broad bipartisan support right now. We could get that done if we had a governor who cared more about the people of Texas than he does his own political career or his fealty to the NRA.